Good morning, Tartaria Hunters. Welcome to Tartaria Australia. Hi, Campbell from Autodidactic. Hello. And in the house tonight, we have Tracy Harding. Woo! Hey, Tracy. <laughs> Tracy got name dropped to us, the author of so many books, so many books. Your backlog is like whoo, longer yeah, than our screen. <laughs> And Tracy, my God, like um, your your full, what would be the right word? Your intuition, your imagination, your nonsense, your knowledge, your gnosis, your mind, your neuropathway, it is wiring and firing. And though you probably never termed it Tartaria transformational consciousness before, you're <laughs> right in the middle of it. Did you know that? <laughs> I actually, after I watched your show, I did. That's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. These guys are like all over this stuff, which is great because we need more people all over this stuff, really. Well, nice. welcome to this Yes, show. tell us a bit about yourself. So um, you've written more than 30 books, is that correct? No, I've got um, I've got 21. Oh, 21. Um, I think you probably get them all because they got one of the books that was short stories and they split them all up into individual oh. e-books. And so I've got, it looks like I've got, like about 30, but actually it's about 21. Um, but I've got another one that I've just written as well. So that's 22. And <laughs> an audio there, I that I just up. put out. So that's <laughs> kind of 23. <laughs> so, Tracy, I don't know. what. Where are you at with the Tartarian journey? Well, I... Um, I started my journey back in um, like oh, 1996. That was with the ancient future. And I, I was basically just writing about what interested me. I mean, I really wasn't looking to be published. I came out of school with like in fourth form or that's what year 10 now with a D in English, dyslexic, couldn't spell. So I wasn't actually thinking about becoming a writer per se, but I was a storyteller big time. And I would just, and, and they just roll off the top of my head, you know, um, speaking of nonsense, like yep. absolutely, I would just go there, go anywhere I wanted. And when I started writing The Ancient Future, it was because I'd been in the film industry for a while and I'd wanted to make films, but I have an imagination that's like this big. And <laughs> like way back in, you know, the 80s when I was in a film industry, nobody had that kind of budget here, you know? So it was like, you know what, I think I'm going to write a book. And even though everyone was saying there's no money in writing books, you know, only, you know, the top 2% of people ever make a living out of it, blah, blah, blah. Um, I just went, well, I'm sick of waiting for everybody to nod their head. And so this way I can do it on my own. So just dove right in. And at the time I was really interested in um, like places of power, like ley line crossings, all the earth light phenomenon that happens around those places. And it wasn't a far stretch to sort of think, you know, they could be time portholes, especially at certain times of year where they resonate more than others. And so I got a female martial artist from the present day and just threw her back into the dark ages with a bunch of knights. It was so much fun. And I was having so much fun. <laughs> and I just kept rolling with it because... I'm just so interested in all those greater mysteries. Why are we here? How did this get here? Like you are, like mm -hmm. I've been uh, watching like uh, Campbell's work on all the sunken, would you call it sunken city? Mud, like mud, that mud flutters, yeah, sunken buildings. Um, and just going, you know, our history is so um, kind of, uh, you know, a bullshit meter, it's very high. Yeah. <laughs> all oh. of our history. You're being very kind there, Tracy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have no idea. And, um, and you know, even when I was writing the books, because because I was delving into history, I had a lot of people sort of going, oh, they didn't have castles like that back in the Dark Age and and they didn't build villas and all that sort of And I'm going, what? So they had the Romans go through there. All the locals were the ones doing the craftsmanship and they just all went back into grass huts. I don't think so, you know. I think that they would have taken over those fortresses. They would have reinforced them and they did actually because Viriconium in uh, uh, just outside of Wales there was definitely rebuilt around probably the time they considered Arthur was alive, although Arthur is a complete myth, 
which was another reason why I wanted to go back into that age because I'm going, well, because every myth is based on something. Mm -hmm. Mm. And so I wanted to go back and sort of take a look at who might have been the real Arthur. And as it turned out, I landed on Mel and Gwyneth and Gwyneth and uh, Taliesin and because Meriden actually didn't exist for like another hundred years after that. And mm-hmm. so I'm thinking, why is he associated with Arthur? Why is Arthur associated with Cornwall? And obviously these are Welsh stories. So obviously that's where you've got to go look for, you know, that particular per- person or the encapsulation of whoever that person was. And as it turned out, I probably landed on the right family, but I think uh, I, by the time I'd written all because there's 13 books in that series. And by the time I'd got back to the prequel, I kind of hit on Owen, Owen Danguin, who was like uh, Melwin's uncle. And he is probably the one that is most likely to have been Arthur. He's the one that probably rebuilt Viriconium. That was probably Camelot, blah, blah, blah. So I was just fascinated in all that, which is why I started writing. I just did it for the fun of it, really. And now I... and You know, I went back into Atlantis in the second book and in the third book we came forward in time to the Gathering of Kings and then seriously the books just kept getting more and more esoteric. We kept going weirder and more wonderful places, (laughs) the other world, the underworld, other planets, other universes, you know, different dimensions, planes of existence, you know, there's nowhere that my characters did not go. And, you know, that's why they were so great to hang out with. It was just like, and everybody loved them. It's kind of like a a coming home, a kind of, um, Mm. you know, that chicken soup for the soul kind of feeling. For the star seeds. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Exactly right. And so people just read them over and over and over again. But as they become, I think as they become more switched on, they actually get a deeper meaning out of it all the time. And I mean, I didn't even realize I was doing that. I was just following what my muses were putting out. And uh, I still go back and read things and go, Oh my god, that's amazing! (laughs) (laughs) Get sucked into my own books when I've got to go back and do research. (laughs) So, Trace, like, um, you know, I don't know. You've probably caught up to date on the fact that Campbell and I are on a quest for actually going on a real physical journey into the desert to look for a crystal city. Okay. So we're literally yep. doing this, and we're taking our cameras with us, and we're going on the hunt for the crystal city. It's Excellent. random. We've made it up. Um, but now since we put it out there, we've had so many people and interesting stories come forward and evidence turn up. And it's just like we just had to name it. And then boom, the portal opened. And so much has come that has now validated its actual um evidence of its existence and it's the total possibility and potential especially now as we waver around all these timelines going up and down and all the impact of like messing with time we're and so yeah very interesting because I mean um when I think when Joe was on she was talking about my books now it wasn't I don't think it was in this series like the ancient future series although we did um, kind of cover like the the secret brotherhood, like the sacred brotherhoods and stuff like that, like the Galactic Federation and stuff like that. But I think it was in the Mystique series, that was a three book trilogy, um, that we were dealing with Tara, which was basically Earth's like etheric double, which was very much what you're describing. Mm-hmm. And uh, portholes, I think there's portholes all over this planet, especially where ley lines cross. And if you've ever stood in the middle of uh, like a stone circle, it's amazing. And I'm not talking about Stonehenge. Like I went and saw Stonehenge and to me that was kind of like watching a caged animal. It was kind of, I I did not get a good vibe from it at all. And it was funny because a a Gaelic friend of mine uh, who can read Gaelic said that they actually moved Stonehenge Mm. uh, quite some time ago Mm. and that it's actually further across country Mm. where it originally was, like Mm. that crossing. Um, But standing in the middle of a stone circle, you can feel the energy. Like seriously, if you've got any pent-up emotions or anything like that, you'll be crying and letting it out and blurting it all out within minutes because it's just that intense. Mm. (laughs) So, you know, absolutely. I think there's a lot of things to be discovered on this planet that we just haven't even discovered yet. We've got no idea about. And um, 
you know, a lot of like North Pole, South Pole, Shambhala, like the whole inner earth cities, la la, like there's a million of those places that have been just passed down through the ages. And because the earth has been spinning on its axis, God knows <laughs> where they actually are now because land masses have moved and all that sort of thing. Well, so, I have to say, you know, there is a theory that Atlantis is under the polar ice caps, but there's mm. other theories that it's mid-Atlantic, like the Azores around that area. That's where I pinned it to be. Mm. Um, but, you know, there could definitely have been more than one major city. Well, there was, you know, absolutely throughout time. And so, so and, but, you know, as a, as a far as the, um, the, the crystal city goes and etheric realms and stuff like that, that definitely, you know, I'm, pretty well sure that it's all out there just waiting to be discovered. <laughs> it is. Have, have you seen star forts yet? Have you come across star forts? Uh, no, I don't think so. No. <laughs> <laughs> star forts. Tell me, um, tell me. They're these um, big structures that we're told are military forts, but they're shaped like cymatic shapes, like stars and um, different. Like the moon. Of... I'll show you. <laughs> um, different, uh, just like stars, yeah, somatic patterns, and they're everywhere. And we think that they're probably on ley line points. Mm, mm, mm. Um, ah, okay. Well, I mean, Shambhala would be um, uh, an example of that because definitely uh, we've um, had uh, stories of there being a superimposing um place within that place you know that only certain people can find yeah um, i so don't know if you ever read frequency. the, the uh, what was it the the teachings of the wise men of the middle east i think it was a group of scientists actually oh, went up there it was um masters of the far east yeah my god what an amazing series amazing. don't listen to it in the car because it's absolutely mesmerizing <laughs> <laughs> <had an> <laughs> but these are star forts by the way can you see on the screen Wow. They're all around the world and no one's ever noticed them before. Well, I mean, I ha now that you're mentioning it, I have noticed mm. these. Uh, but everywhere. you don't kind of question it. You just go, okay, somebody built that at some point, you know. That's amazing. Yeah. That is over and over and over again. Anyway, sorry, continue. I'm just illustrating as we're going. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And, I mean, just the same with Adelaide. I mean, they're finding... Um, ruins under the sea like off the mm. coast of japan for example you know yeah. like there's a huge pyramid structure off this yonaguni yeah and i mean uh, one of my books um i had no idea where i was going at the end of uh, i think it was uh the light field and my muses just give me these clues it's sort of like i was getting pyramids you know <laughs> and i'm going <laughs> oh no not egypt like it's been done to death i don't want to i don't want to do egypt you know and then it was like well i was getting this little voice in my head going well there's pyramids in other places on the world mm -hmm. you know and that's when i discovered the ones in china mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i'm just going oh my god there's more pyramids in china than there is in Egypt. Yeah, Egypt, yeah, yeah. Except they keep putting trees and stuff all over, the, like trying to make them look like a hill, you yeah. know. These and are they some won't of them here. open them. Mm -hmm. They mad. won't open them. But, um, you know, I use them in um, another story. And the configuration of one lot just outside Xi'an in China are exactly the same configuration as, as Giza. Exactly yeah. the same. Wow. Yeah. They're everywhere. Yes. This mysterious plane of ours. So I have to say the premise of Tartaria starts with the fact that this realm we live in is flat and it has a firmament over it and a dome, so to speak, and that when we talk about uh, multi-dimensions, we're talking about past the realm, out, out of the realm, the flat realm. And that well, that's the way that the Celts actually portrayed it as a... As absolutely, a absolutely. Uh, mm. So that's really, that's really interesting. And um, if you look through all the mythology um, and all of the original texts from every culture, the earth is flat with the firmament over it. And always this big tree. There's always a tree, a big tree of life, a central tree that goes through it. And we've since, um, in the last week, pieced together, thanks to the um, new E. Warren <laughs> drop, everyone who's been following it, um, that actually 
the giant trees of our realm were the ancient gods and um and it, like and all the mountains i don't know if you know this tracy but all the plateaus and the shat the very pointy mountains they're all shattered or cut down giant trees that we don't have mountains on this plane that's really really uh it, well i mean the druids of course all all of their um sacred places were were tree groves they were absolutely devastated the romans that's the way they beat them is they went in there and they they chopped down all the trees yep check and it. they burnt Look. them you know which was devastating to them well so, absolutely so we've got this comparison now of mountains being tree trunks either the plateaus that have been cut down or they've fallen down and shattered their trunks and, and I mean, this kind of ties in with all these giant, um, these giant skeletal remains that they've found too, oh. which also ties into your oh, building as well, Campbell, doesn't it? Because of those great big, huge doorways they had in everything. It was like, oh. why were they so huge? Mm. You know, yeah, giants. And, and yeah. all the you know ancient Greek dwellings, they were massive. Yeah, yeah. and Absolutely. the further back you go, the bigger things get. Exactly. Yeah. That's really, really interesting. And I mean, we've got tools and like there's there's guns and spears and swords and all types of stuff that's giant just books. giant books. Giant yeah, books, books. I love. <laughs> like I'll show you. Have you seen them, Trace? They're so no, cool. I haven't. Oh, seen you them. haven't seen the books. Oh. oh, they're so good. Look, they're literally this oh, big. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh my god! Like, look at this. Oh my god! Where are yeah. they? Where did they find those? Oh, they've been, they're all over the world, all over the world now. I see they're all yeah, held pictures. in little places where no one can really get to yeah, them. Basically, yeah, they're um, all under the Vatican. All the, all the interesting stuff is under the Vatican. I really yeah. want to get in under the Vatican. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, look, but we've got on. some of the maps. Some of them are map books, and we've got some of the maps out of them, but, but that's all. We don't really know what's in the rest of them. Yeah. And the, there's giant instruments. There's one. Oh my god. That's one of the maps. Yeah. <laughs> so basically what we've pieced together so far is that before the last reset, we so basically there was a situation with the ancient gods who we think now were the giant trees. And the giant trees um and then there was and I can we haven't quite got the chrono, chronological order yet, but um the gods came down, bred with the son of man, so yeah. bred with us humans, produced out of that produced babies who ended up killing their mothers, like literally too big to be in a human stomach, ripped yeah. out, most of the women died. The babies that lived became giants and, um, and they were big, massive, brutal giants that ended up um, This is the whole Anunnaki thing. Yeah, and basically yeah. ate everything they ate all everything and then ended up eating humans and then at the same time there was this big push on genetically modifying everything so yeah. man was bred with beasts with birds with with sea creatures so we get the mermaids and trying get, to do it again uh, exactly yeah, that because exactly. we're on the on the great reset again right mm. yeah so um so yeah so we're at that point of the great reset so this was sort of like 350 300 years ago um, and then to like purge, because we are in a biblical war, like that's beyond shadow of doubt, this is a spiritual war. And the Bible is playing a fundamental role in all of this as probably the most accurate book that's predicting it all. And, um, and if we look at that, and, and literally there's 500 missing books from the Bible. So like, oh, yeah, what... I went into all of that in um, the Mystique trilogy as well. Yeah. But the, the whole um the, um, sorry, what were you just saying then? Okay, so to... we've got this storyline being pieced together right now that so um, God who, who had wanted to cleanse because when we genetically modify our DNA, we no longer the children of God. We become the, we become the children of, well, in our terminology, Satan, really, mm -hmm. like the mimic, the copy, the genetically modified virgin, like GMO seeds. And yeah, that's like what they the do. junk DNA they keep trying to take out. <laughs> yeah. That they had to start calling non-coded DNA because they really don't know what it's for. And and it's really tricky because they mimic, they want to be the gods, this satanic agenda. They want to be the gods, so they and they're not the creator gods, so they have to mimic it. So they take a god seed, 
like a literal seed or like a human being or like a the weather or like an animal and then they modify it genetically modify it and then they own the patent on that genetic modification therefore they become the owners and the creators the creator. of that modification yeah. and that's what the apple juice is doing to our culture right now and every time that happens we enter a great reset and the last great reset came with a, a purge and you know we we have all these stories of the noah's flood but they've added like a thousand years or thousands of years into a timeline so we don't know if that flood was it literally the mud flood that we're talking about here yes. in tartaria and it's like literally it was only 300 years ago god flooded the plain and brought and like took away all life apart from noah's bloodline but we look at it from the trees so at the last week we watched um, an episode of a series and it was basically indicating that the, 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 the fallen gods or the angels cut down the trees and held off the waters while the trees were being cut down. And that's all, then now all of our mountain ranges, et cetera. Right. Um, and then seven, seven um, aqueducts from within the earth opened up and like 30 from with from out the from above the earth and water poured onto the planet and we have the flood the mythologic mythological flood and right. suddenly we have no trees on this plane and all these roots all these just cut down stumps basically and well, um what i found was really interesting when you were talking about the whole mud flood thing and the theories of that thousand years sort of going missing somewhere it's funny because when I want to study history, I have no interest in that period, like anything between the Romans mm. and then the next thing is sort of like the 1500s, maybe the witch hunts and that mm. sort of thing, like that whole period. I know there was some Viking action in there somewhere, but that's not to say that it wasn't happening, you know, at a different time. Yeah. time. Exactly. But it's funny because I've just, like my instinct is always to go, uh, back to like the dark age and before like anything that is is slipping into that kind of legend period mm. where they're not quite sure so even when I went to ancient China it was like you know 200 BC uh, the last book I wrote was like Cambodia same thing 200 BC and then I was coming forward into uh, like just ahead of now and some of the stuff I wrote seriously I had to take it out because I thought I was going to scare people and now it's actually happening and I'm going oh my, that's scary like seriously this should be current affairs I don't know about fiction but um and then I was doing there was another era that was like long into the future where everybody was in the inner earth basically because out here had just been trashed by AI mm. so you say that you get or your muses talk to you or give you ideas so do you do you see that this information is coming from a higher source and is it is it trying to tell a story or is it just creativity I, I think so because as I, as I say like um I mean I just thought I was writing a, a fantasy series you know from for my just for my own curiosity but I have so many people write to me and go like I have memories of of this this stuff that you're talking about you know it's all true isn't it and mm -hmm. it's like I can't, I can't, I mean, how do you even tell what reality is anymore? It's like changing on a daily basis. <laughs> you know? Yeah, fuck reality, <laughs> fuck reality. <laughs> and I mean, I, I, the best I can do is just, um, you know, pass on the information. And seriously, sometimes I start writing these books. There was one, I think it was Eternity Gate. And I did not know where that book was going. I sat down to write it having absolutely no idea where it was going and I just was writing and then we had to go into this dark universe which I didn't want to go into and the whole Gregory thing and um, I was going why are we doing this why are we going here and I was literally three quarters of the way through the book before everything clicked and it just went boom 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 and it was like oh my god and consciously on a conscious level I did not know and mm. I never know. I just go into my books and I just go with it. Just, and yeah, um, and it just all pans out perfectly somehow, you know. Oh so my it's God. almost like I'm taking some kind of ancient memory, mm. maybe from another timeline, another dimension, 
I don't know. And I just am putting it down, you know, and people go, oh, you know, you're, you're channeling this stuff. And I'm going, well, I just call them my muses. I kind of always have. Um, could be guy. I don't know. You, you know, I kind of, um, I just sort of stick with the, I try to stick with the facts because when I get a hit on something, I'll go and research it. And, and quite often I won't agree with the research. Like when they were saying the Britons were all living in grass huts or whatever, I'm going rubbish. You know, and then after I'd written all that, they start digging up villas from that period. You know, it's like, well, I was right. Sorry, historians. <laughs> Man, yeah. Tracy, you're this like, um, if only you knew who you really were. Yes. Like, seriously, <laughs> like you are like um, most definitely one of like the most celebrated historians and most celebrated master teachers and scribes. You, we're just here, like we're just here in our little amnesia game. But most definitely, you are probably one of the world's most renowned historians. And well, I mean, the, the, when I actually first started writing this, I had people like, you know, critics, critics, read The Ancient Future and they were telling me my idol ideology was insane. <laughs> um, one review said, even if you have to, don't read this book. <laughs> And, um, you know, that was my first effort of writing ever. So that kind of hurt. Oh. But then within three weeks, it was a bestseller <laughs> with no publicity, no nothing, unknown right. author. Fuck them. And oh, it no. just, exactly. And it just, and then I, and then they conscripted me for a trilogy. I thought, oh, poor bastard's yeah. going to have to Double read another two em. now. Triple fuck <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because basically like um, most definitely you are writing from a place from um, your future self to your, you, you are the ancient future. That's you. You are the echo in time. You are the master of reality, Tracy. That is you. And <laughs> well, like I actually I actually came into my own story by book six. When you get up to like uh, Cosmic Logos, I actually had to come into my own story to actually explain how this reality fitted in with all the other realities that were coming through in the book. And like, um, you know, like my main character was one of my muses, which I actually felt she was. And she she would overtake me all the time. I was, I was never as strong-willed as uh, until she kind of came into my psyche and then all of a sudden it was just like, I've got my Tory boots on now, man. <laughs> Don't fuck with me. <laughs> all right, Trey, so let me, bring, let me bring you to Australia. So your yeah. homeland, your homeland, you were born here in Australia? Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, whereabouts in Australia, Trace? I was born in Ryde in Sydney. Yep. Mm -hmm. So yep. I came, I sort of was brought up around um, sort of Carlingford down there in New South Wales. So Westie. I was yep. a Westie from Sydney. Yeah, cool. And, um, you know, really uh, not really, um, I, I wouldn't call spiritual, you know, like my mum used to make me go to church and we used to wag and stuff, go hang down the bush instead. <laughs> wag. You sound like Kylie Mole. <laughs> Spazzo and wag. You remember Kylie Mole? And a ciggy, <laughs> you know, down the bush instead. And, um, and so it wasn't until I think um, I discovered, uh, well, I think early on we had a ghost in our house, so that probably triggered stuff for me. Was that was, just you or was that a ghost? That was a ghost. Okay. There was a ghost, ghost that mm -hmm. used to walk around the house and you knew it was walking around the house because we had this in the dining room, we had a cabinet that rattled when you walked past it. So you could hear when he was doing laps of the house, right? Or you'd be vacuuming and he'd come right up behind. You could feel like, oh, it, it, you know, things, we had things go flying. So it was a bad coming. vibe, a bad feeling energy. Yeah. Um, so that kind of got me interested in, you know, stuff that was paranormal, like, you know, and then I discovered the Adia bookstore in Sydney. And I think really that was that was it for me. I could have just lived there. Just all that fantastic. It was like, why, why weren't we taught this in school? Or mm. like, you think everybody would be talking about this stuff. Mm. And I had a whole bunch of girlfriends and we were all into different stuff. Like, you know, somebody was into crystal, somebody was into natural healing, somebody else was into places of power, somebody else was into, you know, and we'd all just get together like a couple of times a month probably. And, um, you know, drink tea and, 
um, smoke a lot and t- talk theories about all sorts of stuff. Ah, and- that's my favorite afternoon. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> The best use of time ever. And I think, you know, kids don't get that now. It's like, how can you, like, they're not filled with that that mystery and, and wonder. They don't know what real, well, my kids do because I've, I've absolutely plowed it into them that magic, creating real magic is creating your own reality. And the way you do that is you sit down and you converse with the universe and you ask for what you want. You don't chase things, you bring them to you, you know. I've never chased anything. It has always come, you know. And I've asked for some pretty outrageous things, you know. I was sitting on the veranda one night when we'd moved up here to Brisbane and I was thinking, wow, you know, it's really about time I got back to doing that TV series or making a film. I really need a producer and I don't want someone who's a creative, okay? I want someone who can get the money to get this thing made. And I went, you know what? I really like, I won't name the show, but there was a show I was very fond of. It was very big. And oh, come I on, went, what is it? Come <laughs> on. Can we guess? Can no, because I'm not allowed to let the cat out of the bag. Oh. Like you, everybody will know. So, but I can say it's very, very big. It was very, very popular. And I said, now I need somebody with that kind of vision. Like the producer on that show would be perfect. And seriously, two days later, I had a call from um, FBM, who I am a film brand management, who I am contracted to. They've got the option. And she kept talking about this producer that she loved, that she worked with a lot, that I would really love him, blah, blah, blah. Turns out he yeah. was the producer of that show, you know. So I just went, two days it took. And that was like a one in a zillion chance of that happening. And I didn't even look for it. It came to me. So that's making real magic happen. And you do it yep. in everyday life. And you do it by staying on top of your emotions, on top of your thoughts, and just being in gratitude all the time for everything that's happening and it just comes you know Mm -hmm. and so I think that kids these days kind of um miss that they Mm -hmm. don't you know and this is why we have so many of them getting depressed and you know that sort of thing and it is really hard being a kid these these days Uh. even though some of the toys they had to play with like oh my god if I had had those when I was their age I would be so much further ahead in my career, I'd probably be animating my own movies by now. <laughs> oh, it's true, isn't it? We have, but unfortunately, it's also a fast food culture. So, you know, like I also had a bookstore. There was the Theologian Society here in, in Melbourne City, <sighs> and that was my bookstore. Like it was just so significant. I sort of discovered it when I was like around 20, and I was just like, that's the, and I I knew there was no other bookstore I could find books at. Like I wanted to read. There was nothing. So, you know, we are of that genre that had a bookstore. I'm sure everyone in the audience had that bookstore. And oh, I'm sure so significant. you would know the Adia. It was on yep. the second floor of the Strand Arcade. You would go up that elevator, the doors would open, and it would just be like smell. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. I know. I know the one. Oh, my God, I love it there. <laughs> All my lunch times when I worked in town was spent up there. And I mean, my bookshelves are filled with their yeah, yeah. Same. So, I mean, and, we, and it's really significant because we know that, like, systematically, one of the biggest focus throughout history is destroying the libraries, destroying the books, taking the books, taking the libraries. And two, we get to this day and age, and people are even questioning the va- the validity of books. Like, what's the point? We're all on our Kindles now. We're all online. Like, no one buys books anymore. You can't be a writer. Like, and it's bullshit. Like. <laughs> Books are so fucking important to the development of your neuron pathways. Yes. Like if you want to deal, like the internet does not do it. It is a, we, it, once again, it's a mimic, a mimic of that experience. You will never, ever have the same experience reading a Kindle as you do reading a book because that energetic mm. funnel, it changes the way your brain's interacting with it. Yes. And so, yeah. And you don't have, uh, when you're watching anything online, you don't have the patience, do you? It's like, it's really hard to find something that draws you in so much that you've got the patience to finish watching it. Mind you, your your videos do, guys, actually. (laughs) I have to say, I just get sucked in. I go, oh, two hours has just gone past. (laughs) Woo, she gets sucked in. (laughs) (laughs) um, With with books, it's that whole um, immersion and it's activating your imagination, you know, 
like I was a product, I have to say that what probably um, I wasn't a reader when I, well, I was dyslexic and I couldn't spell. So obviously reading for me was not going to be my favourite thing. But I saw Star Wars at the pictures and, oh, my God, that was it. For me. I was just like, I want to go there and I want to live there. And I'm just, <laughs> yeah. It was the first time that really kind of took me out of here and now and put me somewhere else. Yeah. But then after that I discovered books and I think, mm probably um, something like the Miss of Avalon or something like that, where I actually discovered that whole pagan side of England, like something that was beyond Catholicism and, you know, it, mm. it kind of, that kind of triggered something. And then, yeah, the Adia bookstore triggered just <laughs> oh my God, yeah. everything like, yeah. you know, and when we went to England, I actually went with um, Paul Devereux's Places of Power, which had all the stone circles marked out. And he'd kind of investigated them all, like what times of year they're kind of active, the ley lines, all that sort of stuff. So it was a really great guide. And to be able to go there and experience it in person, and then you can put that into your work and go, well, this is what it's like. It's not just, you know, just go as a tourist. I mean, one of the stone circles we found, <laughs> we're driving around, I don't know, Cornwall, Devon, and we're asking everyone, we're going, where's, where's these stones, you know? And they're going, oh, up the road yeah you know, nobody would really kind of tell you where they were mm. it was kind of like something it was like some mystery you had to go find it <laughs> and we were driving up a road and there's this tiny little sign that says the stones mm -hmm. it's pointing that way right <laughs> we stopped and we looked and it's like a farmhouse and a gate and I'm going so what do we do we climb over it and the girls are going of course we do of course we climb over it's like off we went over and it's really misty you can't see a thing can't see your hand in front of your face all we can hear is sheep and then the mist parts and here are these stones just sitting in the middle of this field pure quartz crystal stones Whoa. that are way huge and speaking of those giants they're the only people that could have moved those things yeah you no know, seriously um, they were huge and um, standing near one of them, like Siri, you were just like this. Mm. <laughs> mm. just, oh. And, I mean, we saw earth-like phenomena when we were over there, like drove through a mist up in the Scottish Highlands where that was just filled with these lights. And, again, you could feel that same electricity just coming off. It was amazing. Mm. The highlands. And then when that cleared, we're on the top of the Highlands and there's this rainbow all the way like it was just one of those moments that you kind of never forget, you know. Magic, baby, magic. There's magic all around this realm. Yeah. I actually grew up, yeah. ironically enough, um, in between Tweed Heads on the Gold Coast area and right. friggin' St Ives in Cornwall. My family's Cornish and my father's Welsh and I'm Australian. Oh. What a weird combination is that. Hello, that's me. Yeah. That's my story. And I grew up in um, my, a hotel. My parents had hotels. So we yeah. have like all these pensioners coming every week and then leaving and coming all year round. And every Friday night we did a little um, like concert. And Nikki and I, my sister, we were kind of like expected to be a part of this welcoming and farewelling. And so for 14 years, every Friday night, I had to do the chicken dance and the hokey pokey. <laughs> I'm fucking not kidding you. I am a result <laughs> of Cornish wealth parents growing up in Tweed Head doing the chicken dance and the hokey pokey. So when I talk about Master of Nonsense, I'm not fucking kidding you guys. <laughs> I don't know if you remember the chicken dance and the hokey pokey, but I it burnt do. into my soul. <laughs> well, at least they didn't make you do achy breaky heart. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Trace, I'm so fascinated. Like we obviously we're focusing, we're, we're homing this in into Australia because Australia has such a unique premise because we're meant to be only 200 and something years old. So <laughs> right. basically here we are in this magnificent country. Fuck me. It's magnificent. Like yeah. we're, we've got magnificent Tartarian cities all around Australia. Well, there's, got, a, there's a pyramid at Gosford. Uh, there's yes. hieroglyphs up there. Yep, there is. And they're Absolutely. dated accurately, like mm -hmm. way beyond probably even the Indigenous people. And in... Egypt, there's records of people travelling over here and describing yeah. kangaroos and yeah, stuff. Mm. Absolutely. And they've got boomerangs in, in yeah. Pharaoh's tombs. Yes. And the, and the reason is, the reason we've been together. Years, like everyone else. 
we've pieced together is that um, the Indigenous Australians are, were the original civilization on this in this realm on this plane, and um, and all the tribes came from the northern the northern coast tribe. And um, what's fascinating is they were considered the law keepers of the whole realm. So all law, and when they speak about it, Campbell, I've noticed it's like they talk about it like it's an entity, like it's not a word, a, a book of words. It's actually a living, breathing entity. When they say mm. the law keepers, they they hold the law as if it is a thing unto itself. Well, and that's that like was hard. same thing, verbal exactly. tradition. And that law is the law of the land. And the hijacking we've undergone and we're undergoing is the law of the seas. And that's connected to the Phoenicians. So right. we've literally, so the original law keepers were here in Australia and they prophesied a new cook was coming and they moved the law into the heart of Australia somewhere. Yeah. And um, so we've got this, in, so Australia is just, and then we've got this red desert that takes up the whole of Australia. And of course, um, with Tatarian infrastructure and buildings, they're all made out of red brick, right? All of them, these vast civilizations through all of our known understanding of where the, the realm itself, yeah. all red bricks. And suddenly we have apparently this desolate desert landscape all full of red sand. Well, I hear that wasn't in land sea. Yeah, yes. I'm just about to do a video on it. There's an 1837 <laughs> map. Yep. But, um, I mean, yeah. one of the, the third book, Masters of Reality, actually ended up, they had a secret base at Wataraka, which is Kings Canyon there. But we were also, like, a lot of it was revolving around um, Uluru, obviously, because, you know, it's definitely a sacred place. The there. heart, yeah. But Kings Canyon I was particularly attracted to as well. I don't know why. I just, okay. Kings I thought if you're going to put a seat, well, not only that, we had the gathering of Kings happening. So it was kind of ironic that there was a place there called Kings Canyon. So it was like, mm. right. Oh, so what did, what did you, <laughs> what did you um, intuit and tune in about Kings Can Canyon? Um, I just, I had one of my characters had gone forward into the future and then come back to the present day. And he had already foreseen that they were going to need somewhere to hide out from the authorities and he had set up a base there. So um, that's what I got from Kings Canyon is that they actually, they set up this um, underground base there. Okay, keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> like, well, <laughs> I have, really I've never actually been there, but I've got other people that have gone there and just gone, my God, you were so accurate but I'm like that when I zoom into something like I will like research and a lot of the places I go of course you can't research like when you're going to another dimension another planet another universe you can't research that you've got to mm. you've got to dive into your imagination and go there you're like a universal remote viewer man you're like a multi-dimensional <laughs> remote viewer I like to think so because I have well, and I have so much fun doing it you know yeah. it's like to me it's just it's a blast, but there's so much esoteric information that comes along with that, you know, like the whole 12 strand DNA thing that came out in, in one of the books as well, because they, it had, it was connecting with the whole um, junk DNA thing. It's like, how do you know when you're taking parts of DNA out of fruit and stuff like that, that that part isn't the part that actually feeds our soul mm. on another level. You mm. don't know because, I mean, most of you don't even believe we've got a soul. I think, I think scientists have actually figured out that we have a soul and that it does leave the body at their like, breakthrough. Yeah, they've measured <laughs> Yeah, they measured the weight of a body when it yeah, died. Exactly, but I mean, at least it's at least they're getting there. <laughs> it's like, really, because when you said that, I was just about to say dickheads. In my head, I was saying dickheads. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's like they've, they've proven it, but they're, they're still they don't want to believe it. They're still no, rejecting it. Exactly, or or yeah. any of the other like. There's some pretty damn weird stuff going on out there and you know in my last book I thought I was diving way off a deep end you know <laughs> and like having been through uh, like watching what's been going on for the last two years, years. Going, man I, I thought I know it's just like oh my god so I was joking okay yeah. <laughs> and people are going no we're just gonna have to put it in current affairs now <laughs> so with it with your last book and the stuff you took out of it and now like you're we're living it like where did your last book take you like what, what was the title of it 
The title of it is The Twelve Chapters of the Infinite Night. Oh, my God, stop, stop, because Campbell and I <laughs> have been on this trip of revisiting The Twelfth Insight. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> right? Like we've just been like we've gone on this trip. Like we started with the Celestine Prophecy, yes, oh, yeah. as everyone did, most of us did, and then most of us read the first three books and never even got to the last book, which is The Twelfth Insight, and we've just like brought it back up and it's, all about synchronicity and the 12 insights for now. So your book, tell us more, the 12th. The 12 chapters of the infinite night. And the reason the infinite night is describing this dimension that we're in. Okay. The 12 chapters were the 12 different archetypes that we go through, like the fool, the orphan, the innocent, the warrior, the leader, the healer, the creator, the fool, all the, you know, there's a lot of them. Um, and what I wanted it to be was, I want you to get the feel that you were going to like, you were going through a day in the life of this character. And then you were waking up the morning next morning as another, Mm. like, because who's to say we don't do that. Right. That Mm. we're just waking up in the morning, remembering everything that's gone on in this character's Mm. life and you know where you're going. And so, but each character were on a pivotal day to do with a particular teaching, Okay, um, that was, you know, one character was channeling, another chan- ca- character was trying to destroy it, another character had rediscovered it in another age. And so it was all kind of revolving around this teaching, which was very much based on kind of Taoism, because mm. I relate to that very well. It's very earthy, very beautiful here and now. It's not about being lofty and spiritual and leaving here. Mm. It's all about what to do to survive in this place, you know, and how to be at one with this place that you are, mm. you know, because there is only the present, right? Mm. So um, that's what that's what the premise of the book was. But it took me beginning, it took me to ancient Cambodia where this country had been invaded by these invaders that were very brutal and um, they had a temple there and in this temple was all this black goo, this intelligent uh, black goo, right? Oh. The black goo. Um, you know, which by the time we got to the present day, they they had studied this stuff and they knew that it was like uh, basic, they were calling it organic AI, AI. virus. Yep. Okay. Spot on. Um, and <laughs> they were, um, they'd figured out ways to get around it, but it was, you know, had to do with the whole AI agenda and them not really... Uh, it not really relating to our carbon bodies, but really liking silicon, you know, so that whole trying to get us transhuman, it was kind of, you know, playing into them, you know, really like, and um, I had different delivery methods in the book, but I kind of had to cut it back to kind of geoengineering because um, I didn't want to freak people out, but. (laughs) Go nuts with us, man. Don't hold back. We, we, We call that black goo the real. And um, JC mentioned it last week on the podcast, came from a very ancient, ancient demon that's been trapped here and is leaking this black goo. Well, in the book, um, I'm getting chills. Um, In the book, it actually, um, the way that it came through in the book was, uh, it is the demiurge, it is the offspring of Sophia, okay? And Sophia came here and created this planet, Um, like all the ancients called the great earth mother Sophia. Um, And she's kind of in the inner earth, but she created this place for our souls to develop. Now she was never supposed to be involved. Okay. (laughs) She was not supposed to be involved. The demiurge wasn't supposed to happen. None of that, but she came here to make this planet to protect us. And this demiurge was in on another plane of existence, but as far as it was concerned, it created everything, you know, and so it thought it was God and, you know, Um, but it convinced like the ancient priests of Ur that had escaped from um, like Atlantis into like that that part of the world to build the Gobekli Tepe, the only uh, place that's been buried on purpose. <laughs> and through a ritual they did there, they opened up this porthole. Now they thought it was going to open up in front of them and it was going to come through, but it opened up in the atmosphere mm. and this stuff fell through on earth and it kind of got splattered across the world. Mm. So it wasn't just one place that ended up with it. It kind of got splattered everywhere. And um, 
one of those places was in Cambodia where we were dealing with this one. And it seemed to be like almost like the main, but this stuff is attracted to itself. So mm. if it found out about another deposit, it would want to get together. Mm. And mm. world leaders that were discovering it later on, like I often wondered what the what the whole um, Falklands Islands thing was about. Oh. Like why are they the fighting fuck? over a whole bunch of hills and sheep? Like yep. what's the in big the middle thing? of nowhere? In the middle like... of nowhere. Exactly. And apparently there was like a rig there, but it wasn't it wasn't digging up oil. <laughs> and one of the soldiers that was put in charge of watching this stuff while they brought the ships around to load it on, you know, they kind of had a peek at it. And this thing was reacting to being looked at and it was reacting quite violently. Mm. And you had to keep it really, really cold and um stuff oh, like interesting mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. kind of no i'm not going to say that um no, I'll get say. The event. So, <laughs> <laughs> no actually you know what just coming in under tartaria we're uncensored at the moment like there's no algorithms <laughs> cutting us off at the moment we can speak freely for we've got a container for a little bit longer <laughs> yeah exactly mm-hmm. so i just have to be you know but i mean people can get the book and like well hopefully i'm good i mean it's with my agent at the moment and um Hopefully we can get it out there. If not, I will self-publish it because I, I don't know. It is different to my other book. It's probably not as commercially viable, but people who get it will really get it. Like they will just devour the, I love it. It just and but the, the interesting thing was is that it was also associated like in ancient times with um like they created AI to fix the ozone that they you know destroyed bringing this stuff through. And then uh, once the AI are done with that, they've gone, oh, well, we'd like to use them, but we'd like them to be more human. They gave them these beautiful, um, like, I think it was like the Octurians gave them these beautiful um, celestial hearts that kind of made them much more human, gave them this direct connection to galactic centre, pretty much like we have naturally, but it was kind of like an artificial version for them. But then when they decided they, the earthlings wanted to make war on each other, they coated those beautiful hearts in this black goo mm. so that they would fight each other and be hostile. Then they figured out they didn't need to fight each other and they tried to destroy us. Then the Octurians came in and went, okay, no, we're just ending this. So they destroyed all the AI, they put the goo back where it was supposed to go and they took all the beautiful crystal hearts and gave it to Sophia to protect. Mm. Mm. And it turned out to be the only thing that could defend humankind against this goo, right? It would, or uh, the relics of a holy man, you know, something like that, because it, it, it could feel that same mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. connection. But uh, I won't kind of give it all away. <laughs> but it was, it, the ending quite surprised me, I have to say. Um, and really, um, you know, that. The tagline of the book is in the battle of good versus evil, the battle is not over till everybody wins. Mm. Everybody, mm-hmm. not just the good guys, mm-hmm. everybody, mm. you know. So it was like, and once I heard that, I'm going, how the hell is that going to happen? <laughs> so do you have any ideas? How, how is that going to happen? Have you heard about the split, the new earth, all this kind of stuff? Um, I kind of, um, I have heard, like I've heard a lot of theories and what is true to one person may not be true to another person. And really, I just keep my mind open about everything that's going on. I would not say definitively, yes, that's right. Because once you say, yes, I know that's right. That's it. You get blinkered, yeah. right? Yeah. So I just stay open to everything. And, I, you know, because I know I've seen some pretty weird stuff that a lot of people would think. No, you're kidding. Yeah. Um, and yet other, you know, and the same thing, like people will come at me and tell me things and I'll just be going, whoa. <laughs> Not, but I don't disbelieve. I never disbelieve anything. So I'm kind of really open it's to, open, yeah. no, to it's learn. Open and to be. because what I've discovered in all my research is that um, with science fiction, of course, it doesn't have to be real. It just has to be plausible. Right. <laughs> and same with history. Oh, yes, same with history. <laughs> and if it's plausible, it's probable. And if it's probable, <laughs> they're probably it's it's mm. it's probably happening. And mm. it's probably there. the same with all the technology and stuff like that. Like people think, you know, we're we're way behind in nanotech. <laughs> Are you kidding? 
<laughs> it's like, oh my God, they've been uh, so all over this for so long, you know. So long, so long. So have any mm. of the, have you um, interweaved into your sort of, I'm, I, I'm just going to call it future, like you're channeling, that's what you're doing, you're channeling. And, you know, the Tartarian audience is like a brand new motherfucking awesome audience for you because, like, <laughs> they're so up to Even date. Even when I was just mentioned here, I was watching, all of a sudden my YouTube went berserk because I think um, I, I may be suppressed because I have a lot of friends that might be considered a bit renegade. And so I think quite, like, I've watched on um like Instagram and stuff, like I'll be getting all these new followers, but my numbers are not going up and things like that. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's about really that one. weird, you know, or I'll send out a message and I've got all these subscribers on Facebook, but they're not getting it. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. It's like I, I have my subscribers go up like so much a month and then I'll, I'll just randomly lose that exact same number. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I keep that <laughs> It's like, really? Too. But don't forget, we're we're caught in a, a perpetual mandala effect right now. Perpetual, like um, CERN. That there's a mic, there's a smaller version of CERN, and it's it, like in Switzerland or Sweden or somewhere. And some someone was talking about this, and um, a- Elizabeth April, and she was just saying like they're literally turning that thing on every day at the moment to jump and fuck with the timeline to try to alter this thing of this awakening, and it's. Friggin' messing with our heads, man. Like, well, turning the bad guys in and out too. Like, I was listening to Danny Searle, actually. He's Australian as well. He was giving a talk the other day and he was talking about, you know, them opening up those portholes to um, let certain entities yeah. give them easy access. Yeah. You know? mm. yep. that, that's what we all thought it was, like, since it was built. But now at this point, <laughs> <laughs> like just like you say, flicking the switch. Yeah, it's like jerk, 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 jerk. So right. anything is possible and right now. Goes, no, they're mm. scientists, and it's like, but they get paid by someone. Who yeah. do you think is paying those people? Follow the money. Follow the, the money. The <laughs> Absolutely. So in in one level, it's completely. Um, I I know for me personally, like I've got a good brain on my head, and the last couple of months, it's, it's felt foggy. It's felt like I've had to really. It's hard for me to, because I have a massive life that it takes a lot of multitasking and it's hard for me to stay um, like all over that like I yeah. normally do. And I find that I just, ha- I can only really do one thing at a time right now, which is very ineffective for what I've set up around me. Well, that could have something to do with the Schumann resonance as well, because yeah. it's absolutely been going completely ballistic and all the solar flares from the sun have just been so they're all related right I think they're yeah. all interconnected and Absolutely. I think if you're if you're awake and you're talking at this level like you're being affected and in the same way the sun is in the same way the Schumann resonance is and so for us it's like on one hand it's like really counterproductive to our 3d worlds which it is but on our 5d worlds or whatever this level is you're just it's like going great guns <laughs> all the magic flowing through the portals are opening like we're having these amazing dialogues and, you know, so it's manifesting really quickly. Like, and that's the thing. It's like when people kept talking about this 5D ascending and all that, I'm going, no, I don't think that's, that's like, I don't see myself ascending up to heaven and being an angel or something. Like that's not (laughs) the way I see it. The way I see it is either you're here thinking, oh my God, this is awesome. Those are the people that are on fire. They've they've got it. They've integrated, and and they're just rocking ahead. And you don't attract all that bad stuff that everybody else is talking about. You can't. It kind of doesn't really come into your field of existence. And mm. I've always thought that it's like when you are resonating at a certain frequency, it's like you could have the the, the biggest badass in the world walk right past you with bad intentions and just not even see you. Yeah, yeah that, that like is you just don't even register on their radar. I used to live in King's Cross and I used to be able to walk around King's Cross in the middle of the night and not get harassed by anybody, you yeah. know. Mm. But other people will be having huge problems. Yeah. And it's in the way you carry yourself and yeah. it's in the vibe that you put off, you know. Right. And so... Right. The people that are here going, oh, my God, this is terrible and this is going to happen and that's going to happen. You're absolutely right. It is. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. all about oh. the nature of personal reality is a thing that exists, you know. Mm. It's like your reality is everything and what you create and what you think is absolutely everything. So if you think we're all going to get past this and it's all going to work out fine, that's exactly right. It is. Exactly. You know? 
I mean, but it is taking maturity and sovereignty because like I definitely align with that thought process. Um, But this moment in human history, like I'm in Victoria, I'm in Melbourne. Fuck. Hello. And, um, and like, I know I've got to, I've got to make a decision now to, to move out of the state or even the country. I know that I've got to like buy new property. I know I've got to sell old property. I know I've got, I've got like all it's these things like that. As soon as you decide yep. what it is you want, it'll just light up. Boom, boom, boom. Yep. Yeah. I had to yep. do it too. And it was so funny because it happened to me five years ago. I had to shift from where I was. And uh, because all my family had moved up here, my BFF had moved up here and I had no intention of moving. But for some reason, it was like, I would go into a state of panic when I thought about not doing it. And mm. I had to renovate my house. I had to sell. And for some reason, the market just went up at that time. Yeah. Mysteriously, just really went up. And we sold for a fantastic price. And it all just fell into place. Like, seriously, mm. I had moved my whole entire existence in, what, two days? Out of two days. <laughs> up into a new place. Like, bang. Um, so it's like you just have to know what you want to get what you want, seriously. Mm, mm, and mm. so I absolutely get where you – and, I mean, I my ex, who still comes up here for Christmas, uh, comes up to Brisbane and he's, like, skittish because it's like, what, what, why is nobody wearing a mask? Why are you not distancing? Like, he, you know, and it was just like, can you remember this is how it used to be <laughs> before you were – Really? Yeah, like 250 yeah. timeline jumps ago. This is what it used to be. Remember those days? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, even he has has kind of cottoned on to what's going on and he's he's a really, you know, straight, hardworking guy, but he's, I think even he has sort of gone, yeah, my bullshit meter is starting to be. <laughs> um, just, Yeah. Um, which is great because it makes it so much easier for us to have a, a conversation without, you know, getting into it. And and that's the thing too is like uh, losing this need to be right or or to put your um, your beliefs on that's something right. else. Which is mm. why I rarely do. I rarely talk about spiritual. I mean, I do in my books. It all comes out in my books. But it's up for people to take away what they want from that and to investigate the things that interest them. I don't really do spiritual lectures because I think spirituality is a very individual thing, you know. Yeah, this like, is one of, one of my pet peeves, and right? Of course you're going to have disagreements. and Spiritual people. Huh? And I just don't want that kind of, you know, I believe what I believe and I just rock along with that and um, mm. I just keep taking in new information and rocking along with that. <laughs> yeah. And I find that's the kind of best way to do it. But the Schumann residence, oh, my God. Like if I wake up at one o'clock in the morning for no good reason, I can pretty well guarantee that that, that the human rest is going off. I remember waking up one night and I was literally like this. It was like I was trying to unplug something from my third eye. Now that's that's a lot for me to admit, mm-hmm. but it was that's what it felt like. It was just mm-hmm. like, oh God, will you just stop? Stop. <laughs> I've had enough. I just want to sleep, please, you know. But it, I, I was wide awake by that point. It was like, oh, okay, well, I may as well get up and do some work. Yeah, <laughs> so I've heard that you do um, other work like tarot and things like this. Is that correct? Well, what I do is when I do um, when I do tarot readings, I don't. It's not like a tall, dark stranger is coming into your life. <laughs> I don't try to predict the future. With yeah, what I do. Tomorrow is I use cards the same way I write a story. Mm. So I look at the research that's in front of me. Yeah. I may even go and see what those what are the meaning of those cards, but quite often I'll disagree. Like I'll see the story playing out in front of me and that's what I tell somebody. And it's like, okay, this is what the universe wants you to know right now. Um, you're probably avoiding talking about a particular subject. Somebody's bossing you around. You really don't need that. You need to kind of deal with it, but you need to deal with it this way, you know, like blah, blah, blah. And I just kind of, it's more like... Um, positive reinforcement from the universe and I can't count like actually I think every single person I've read for has gone back to me and gone oh my god how did you do that like you just hit the nail right on Mm. the head it's because I don't question what's coming through yeah this is the thing it's a belief like you said before if you believe it you, you create it yeah 
I've got a good, I've got a fun game going on with myself at the moment. So I've got like um, 20 books on the go and I'm <laughs> deliberately not reading the last chapter of any of them. So, um, and when I finish the 20 books, I'm going to go back and read the last chapter of every single book in one go. And like, so that I get this entire like summary storyline and it's a mixture of like, um, in, it's a mixture of like farming, food, um, your books in there, um, <laughs> like a whole pile of random fucking Martin Leckie's book in there, like the 12th Insight, all these books we've been like looking at. And I reckon in one hit, I'm going to have the whole, I'm going to have 12 or 20 actually keys all lined up in one store. And I think exactly. that's a fantastic way to read books. Like, why are we taught to read them so linear in this <laughs> such a like ridiculously non-linear reality we live in? It's just another example of programming. So well, imagine excellent. if we took the last chapter of every single one of your books and read it as one whole story. Yes. <laughs> well, it's funny because the last book I wrote, you know, the 12 chapters, because it was 12 different chapters over three different time periods, I had to write the book sideways like, <laughs> yes, rather than exactly. linear yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, I yeah. had to kind of do a bit of this one, do a bit of that one, do a bit of this one, do a bit of this one, come back to this one, go over to that one. So it was kind of written sideways. Yeah. And I've never written like that before. It, that was yeah. a real challenge. It was probably the hardest book I've ever written and I think it's probably the most important. And, um, yeah, it's incredibly spot on. <laughs> This is crazy. This was to write, but I'm looking back at stuff I wrote four years ago and going, oh my God, that's now. <laughs> that's this was the first book I ever wrote. It's called The Secret Book of Useful Things. Oh, that's beautiful. And it's the most prophetic book I've ever. It's I, I illustrate children's books. Oh, oh you can't gorgeous. see probably. But basically, it's guided. I wrote this when I was like 21. And it's guided my journey this lifetime so insanely. And, like, when I realised that, I was like, man, every single thing I touch from my imagination is just my roadmap into the future. It is my psychic abilities to know my, like, destined journey here. So in summary of where we stand today, like, what is going to happen, Tracy? What's going to happen? With, from the depths of your understanding, hold nothing back because our audience is supremely smart. You can say anything. Well, that's actually a really good, I kind of, I, I mean, I'm a, it's a bit like when I write my book, I like not knowing. I like waking up in the morning and oh, being surprised that's by a what the hell's happened. Like I will go to sleep and go, okay, let's you know make that it up then. person in politics that I really don't like, I really need you to get rid of that guy. Okay, all of them. Be gone happen. with all of you. And, and it's so funny because all of a sudden you're seeing them go, down one by one they're all getting thrown to the wolves and it's kind of like well that's really interesting and that's that's the way it's like what's going to happen is what we make happen what yes. we create and we don't even have to go out there and fight in the streets although that I'm not fighting in the streets I mean peaceful protests yeah really fantastic but um it's really about your own little piece of real estate and I mean mm -hmm. it's like if you can keep this peaceful if you can keep this space gorgeous and everybody who walks into your space feels that and takes that away and makes their space like that you know and this is what my books do to people it's like yeah it's a fun story but at the same time you are getting this whole inner click in your head about creating your reality how to do it how to get in touch with yourself what chakras are how's yours work um, all like a whole gamut because I read Blavatsky like she was one of my first influences oh, yep. now <laughs> I remember somebody going you don't read Blavatsky you kind of reference Blavatsky I said well I didn't I read it cover <laughs> to cover and I understood exactly what she was talking about she was talking quantum physics before we had the language for quantum physics she used different terms for it but she was all over it what I didn't like was she had to spend half half the time explaining herself like cutting off her critics to try and lead into whatever she was talking about because she was just so criticized for every I wouldn't have bothered I would have just <laughs> I don't bother actually she has just, some dodgy you know. seed points there doesn't she yes She's connected to the real society and uh, you know she was absolutely you know there was a, so many people that have been just absolutely amazing channels for information and, um, you know, 
a lot of them probably were like you. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) It is. It's you. Tracy, tell me, come on. You are, um, you are a multidimensional, very revered historian. You are like, you know that about yourself, right? I already know who you are. So tell us from that perspective, (laughs) how does history write this story? Just like, I'm not saying it's going to be everyone's story, but generic, generally speaking, we're about to see a split in two worlds. Would you concur with that? Um, I would concur. Um, at, well, from, even from the oldest esoteric information will tell you that that was destined to happen. And but that you probably wrote, by the way. That <laughs> love who you are. Uh, uh, kind of not really making the grade are going, their souls will be recycled into like a reality or um, that is kind of, that is going to help them get yeah. Get up to par. Um, at the same time, the people over here are going to be moving on to the next thing, maybe to Tartaria. We take three. Irish just called it Tara. You know. Well, that's you can't miss that, can you? Tataria and Tara, very similar. Exactly. The association is just yeah. Yeah. But we'll we'll kind of go on to. But the thing is, really, in when. We're all not getting out of here until we're all there, okay? So it's this is why you cannot judge another person, you know. You've got to really just love everyone. Your enemies are your greatest teachers, seriously. So it's like you just have to have that patience. Look at the Buddha. He wasn't going anywhere. He's still hanging around somewhere waiting for us all to get out. (laughs) Sitting under a tree. So we can all move on. And that is what I see happening how it's all going to play out in this society, I think good will always win. The light will always win. Shadow always has to retract from the light. I'm sorry, because it can't it can't exist in the light. Mm. You know? Yeah, you can't turn a dark on in a light room and make it no. dark, but you can exactly. turn a light on in a dark room and make it light. That's right. You know, unless somebody falls in black goo, okay? <laughs> that freaking black goo, that fucking black goo, it comes up, it's, it's like a freaking horror story on in every direction, that black goo. And I'm um, going to tell you. Danny Searle was talking about that last night because he was saying that, because um, he was talking about um, reptilians and that they existed on the fourth dimension and that's what they eat because basically that's basically fear and bad thoughts and like all those. Like um, terrible thought forms manifest into that stuff in my story it was actually sucking the souls out of people Mm. like it fed because it was trying to get that feeling it got when it was connected to those crystals especially you know but it couldn't it couldn't when it got somebody very spiritual in front of it it would try to cover them in goo so it wasn't affecting them because it would pacify them you know, anything of a high vibration would pacify this stuff, you oh. know. So that I thought was really interesting. Information. And that would that would under, undermine all the stories we have with the genocide um, of our children and the especially our Indigenous children around the world. Like that, that sort of, inter, like there would have been something in that because what was our term the other day? Instead of SAR seeds, we, we are terming organic consciousness. Organic, con- yeah. So a consciousness that is an of the the realm and is of um god carbon based yeah so um so that organic consciousness is particularly in our indigenous and the 12 strand dna bloodline um wow they've been doing insane terrible experiments on them genetically underground of course and i had this theory that potentially um, where whatever happened with that great deluge um, um, and that flood and Tartaria, that timeline being reset and um, the ether being manipulated. So suddenly all that free healing, high frequency energy was manipulated um, to create this false um, paradigm that we're in, this mimic realm. Um, it was that black energy, that that source material coming in from underground and utilising the structures, because Tartarian structures, the tech involved with the Tartarian structures, mm-hmm. um, was basically drawing energy from the ether and utilising frequency, so sound harmonics through organs and massive instruments into um, through the cathedrals and into water. And this is like this circular, beautiful, divine economy of those resources. And somewhere in there, there was a hijacking that presented a 
false, flipped over, inverted, mirrored, black mirror, that Netflix series, black mirror yeah, reality. Mirror. And yeah. it's always, they always associate it with black. So yeah. the black goo coming in and through that process makes total sense to me. And mm. then, of course, they take all the black people, all the black original people of the land, and they genetically like attack to the hardest degree. And yeah, I mean, we've just because I think that twelve and because strand, young ones too don't have the capacity; they haven't developed that that tough skin. Because I mean, you haven't really de- come fully into your body until you're what six years old or something, you know. So depending on the experience you get before that time is how that child. So when they want to do like all that MK Ultra stuff, they'll be getting the kids like really young so that they can be you know programmed much by the time they're kind of 13 they can kind of send them out as as agents or what have you but you know the goo itself is crystalline you know and the yeah. fact that you're talking about it going up that energy that's exactly what it was doing in my book as well it was like because it was a attra- it was attracted to it but at the same time it was it was pacifying to it as mm. well like that beautiful energy was kind of pacifying yeah, it. Was like uh, there was like one deposit of it and they had, you know, they'd kept one of the the relics of the Buddha on top of where they were storing this thing. They kept it frozen, very cold, mm. but to stop it getting aggressive because it won't, it won't freeze. You can pacify it. You can make it sluggish, but very hard to freeze. Um, so they had like a relic on top of it and that kind of just made it all kind of, yeah, because they oh, found some, didn't they, in Egypt? Was it Egypt in a tomb? Yes, in, yeah, that's right. Well, you could yeah. tell something had been in that sarcophagus and had crawled out and gone somewhere. <laughs> God, and that's that's, where it that's is very now. interesting because... Um, and the same with the Falklands. Okay, all right. That's oh, really, really interesting. Okay. Yeah, because there was an oil rig there, but it wasn't mining oil. And so those guys, mm. like... But, and oh. when they took it back, because it went back to England apparently because i mean that's what they were the ones that were fighting to get mm. this yeah yeah and the, the people that had dealt were dealing with it like the scientists and everything that were trying to work it out and what to use it for like were dying in mysterious circumstances like i mean how does one s- suicide by decapitation <laughs> self decapitate like Only just reading the Black report man. going okay that's that's weird. Yeah, that's, <laughs> okay, uh, so this is really mental. interesting because obviously if you, uh, my first introduction to the black goo on television was the X-Files and that was, um, and they encapsulated it in ice. So it was in the Antarctic that that was the, the hub of that. And interestingly, when we look at um, what the firmament is made out of, what because from all of our understandings, we have a firmament over it and above us is water. And that firmament is blue ice. You have you seen these this information, Campbell, where it's actually yeah 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 I did a, a video very on specific... it. Yeah, it's, it's um uh Scott. They call it sky ice, basically. Sky ice. It's, yeah, it's it's um it's just ice, but I think it's high in oxygen or something. And it and they have found walls of it in the Antarctic. Yeah. And when they make holes in it, it grows back. It, it grows basically back. just grows back and fills a hole in. Um, and, and they can't, is, yeah. yeah, it's just got all these weird properties. And apparently it, in some countries that they've got some because it just fell from the sky. And all <laughs> of the holes, all and it basically if there's a hole in the firmament, it grows back. So yeah, when we talk back, yeah. about the, the, the black like the, goo, it's almost like the blue ice, the sky ice that makes up our firmament, our dome. It's a counteractive measure, like the counteractive force, like nothing can, like this black goo can't escape. It's almost like, if I'm bold enough to say, that our firmament is a quarantine, is a, is a realm quarantine in keeping this black goo in and it can't get out. This, black, this blue ice is the counteractive of the black goo. And that's to me, okay, so I was always taught, one of my teachers always said, earth is under quarantine and you cannot get out or get in. And when he said that to me, I was thinking, I'm, I understood understood the idea, but now that we know all that we know, this is 20 years ago, it's like, yes, there is now a containment, a toxic containment issue on in this realm. We have been encapsulated in a security measure 
that do, that is the counteractive measure to this black goo and this and which means all the portals out of the realm also got stopped which means the whole not satanic, all because okay, not, these mk ultra guys they do they been, travel around yeah it's true they've been sent out there by whoever is well they're definitely forcing it with cern i mean like they're definitely trying said, to doing it with ai prison planet yeah prison yeah. planet so the counteractive measurement to us breaking down that quarantine process, I think the game, the end game for us is unconditional love. Oh, absolutely. That the is frequency. like any, any prophet, spiritualist, anything will say that. Now, um, the demiurge or whoever's working for them will try and flip that, you know, yeah. go, no, it's all about you. And it is all about you, but it's all about you giving unconditional love to everything. You know, like like I said, your enemies are your greatest teachers, you know. And a, a lot of these guys that have been abducted by aliens and stuff like that, when they've stood their ground, their will, that, that they got to let them go because they can't, they can't do anything with that. <laughs> it's like he's not cooperating. <laughs> yeah. Which is the same as what's happening down here. It's it's definitely seems to be a free will. Even if we're under quarantine, while well, we're in here, it's supposed to be free will. And they can tell us this stuff and they can coerce us and offer us free donuts. But in the end, you know, we get to choose yes or no. And it's interesting because, like, you know, when we say unconditional love, it's, a, it's you know, it's been put into the spiritual realm and the new age realm so much. It's just like, you know, it makes people think of oracle cards and fucking fairies. But, like, unconditional love, if we look at it as an entity, like we actually see it as a solid entity. We're talking about this black goo as an entity and what it represents is all the fears, all the depression, all of the men. It, it represents our lower frequency range mm. of emotional human feelings. If we look at the blue ice, we can see that as like a protective shield, like a container, a containment. And then we look at unconditional love, not as a sentiment, as a fucking sentiment about gratitude, but as its own entity. What does that actually look like? Now, we, we've we been all shown the work of that Japanese scientist, Emoto, who did the yeah. ice crystals. Interesting yeah, yeah. that we're talking about crystals again. Yeah. So the black goo is a crystal. The sky ice is a crystal. And now the crystal of our actual water. Interesting that water comes through with the Tartarian history a lot. And there was an inland sea here, water again. And we've got water above us, water below us. And all the whole disclosure community was all about watch the water, watch the water, watch the water the last 18 months. So we look at unconditional love from the lens of Emoto's experiments. And it basically, what does it do? It um, geometrically, symmetrically aligns a beautiful crystal. It turns a fucked up crystal into perfect symmetry again. Exactly. So what do you think enough of that is going to do to that black goo? Because yeah. You can't expect something to love when it's never known love. It only knows our lower frequency range. It only exactly. knows our But presence. it is attracted to our creativity. It's attracted to that connection we have to galactic center. It's attracted to, like, it wants that. It wants that. It just probably hasn't figured out how to achieve it, you know? So. All right. This is, so, it, so we live on a poison planet. And everything about our planet is poisoned. And for the most part, now most of majority has voluntarily put a poison in their body. And then all the poison we ingest and contaminate all the time anyway. But like poison is coming from the black goo aspect of ourselves. And energetically, emotionally, that's the poison. So the new earth. Go on, you're busting. <laughs> yeah. Spit it out. It's. <laughs> Like, I mean, a lot of these, uh, you know, one of these black goo pools is supposedly in what, um, is somewhere like Paraguay, one of those South American places, I can't remember, but I think it's Paraguay. And a lot of those so-called, um, you know, Dems have um, properties all, all around, like in the, around this thing, yeah. right? So I'd say it's, it's, it, it could very well and I mean in my story it was very it was driving everything yeah so that's like, that's the entity pretty much that they're worshipping yeah and it's really really smart like it's mm -hmm. telepathic it knows it's, what you want yeah it knows how to get you on board hive mind 
keep you on board. <clears throat> yeah, hive mind, definitely. And this is why if you get two lots of this goo very close to each other, it wants to join up. It wants to come together. Yeah, and do you know what that reminds me of is um, you know, this graphene, right? Have you seen the videos yes. of that stuff? Mm-hmm. Well, exactly. I would hazard a guess because in, in the story it could also solidify and become it was more passive yeah. solidified but it was it was it was you had different uses yeah yeah you know and it could be in, integrated into machinery like chris any other crystal but it organic bodies <laughs> uh, yeah uh, you know and um like i said uh, you know and this all this talk of integrating tech into our body i mean it mm. would just love that 2045 yeah well exactly if it's if that's what it's hunting for if that's what it wants is the connection then it would be thinking well i just take over everyone and then i get their connection right (laughs) whether that's right or wrong you know and i mean um i think like the anunnaki like the whole story of the anunnaki was very similar they were after gold you know they just clean the plant like just make enslave everybody get a workforce going get get all the gold and you know nick off this thing is the same thing but it's after it feeds on photons like which is what we emit when we're afraid, when we're sick, uh, because that's what we emit to heal ourselves. Like it, cu- it comes out of our penile mm. gland. Like uh, we emit photons. You can count mm. photons in people, mm. but it's mm. it's mm. way more of it because usually we generate that light ourselves. Okay, when we're healthy and stuff like that, we we just generate. But uh, I think it was in uh, the light field uh, you had. Um, like psychics being tracked down because of their light, but you could actually see it through a photon camera that, you know, they were uh-huh. emitting light. But when somebody's really, really sick or really afraid, you get like huge adrenal bursts of this stuff and they just yeah. just gorge themselves yeah. on it. Yes. And yeah. which is why your children in particular are particularly, uh, you know. Vulnerable attractive. and attractive. Yep, yep. And all the wars... And all the ter- there's so much terror. They've just rained terror down on this planet. So hardcore, a planet yeah. realm, realm, realm. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting. So it feels like, you know, it feels like we just sort of when we talk about unconditional love and and you know really focusing on that sort of energetic, it feels so intangible and tiny in comparison to this fucking goo that's taken over the whole planet and the whole fucking it's you know when like but i was because that's that's what gives me that just that sitting in that amazing space is what brings all the images it's what brings all the information it's like as a writer mm. when you get into your work and you're really enjoying it you go to somewhere else yep it's just like time and space disappears when I'm painting, and, same, same. And that's the that's the holy grail. Okay. That's like, and that's huge. Yeah. It envies that because it doesn't have it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It Agreed. really wants it. It's very good at emulating things, but it can't create itself. Which would then equal that if um if our um purpose to being God created entities, energies. Our arm is to make known the unknown, which means we are the creators, which means we are in God's image, the creator. Our energetic is to be of God, to create. And that you have to do through your imagination and your creative faculties. And interestingly enough, Trace, I work in Regent Ag. And like one of the side effects of all this poisonous low nutritional food is that our hypercampus has depleted 21%. And that is a shrinking of the creative faculties in our brain. So deliberately, they have actually shrunk people's imagination. So get off the GMOs and get back (laughs) into your garden because you are actually eating your imagination away. And that so with, with each one of us that steps into that create the unknown it's probably it's like energetically worth a million who are not yeah but you also have to know and I mean people that are on a very physical level that is that is going to happen but I also firmly believe that something is bad for you if you think it is 
you know there's totally. guys out there that can just survive on water yeah you know? so it's like right, it's right. really not about what we're putting in our bodies it's what about already what's already in here you know and how our brain functions and what we believe ultimately obviously mm. we believe that good food like straight from the garden is going to be awesome for us and of course it is because that's what we believe you know so there's a balancing there too i remember um i don't know if you remember seth like um mm. jane roberts used to yep. channel this energy called seth speaks and um she i think she was a chronic smoker actually most um kind of I, very spirit, like blavatsky was also a chronic smoker i have um, been but, also <laughs> <laughs> exactly and i just um, think we smoked a lot of pipes through our I think it's part of who we are. Those I pipes want to get change. A pipe. I've been those pipes about it change. Now, like a um, pipe. <laughs> it actually brought nitrogen into our system, which actually well, put us on a standing of gigant. Like it was, it raised us. There was something actual tobacco, very- like proper native tobacco, is it's not bad for you. It actually oxygenates your blood. Yeah. Um. Does that's why it was a shamanic herb. It's only all the chemicals that they spray all over it. Yeah. So and God knows if, if it's even it's tobacco. Like, it could I mean, be anything in like, there nature's little miracle yeah absolutely what kind of cure you know yep. seriously amazing no. um and you know i would love to just see that thrive it would solve so many problems so many and, and it is already people that i thought would never be into cbd and stuff like that uh just going oh my god this is amazing but yeah um uh, jane because uh, jane used to channel seth and her husband used to ask seth questions and while Jane was out of her body, she'd go write books. But um, I remember her husband asking uh, Seth once, um, you know, is smoking bad for you? And the answer was, do you think it is? Hmm. And that was it. That was it. Was it. Yeah. Like, that is the whole answer. Yeah, <laughs> Excellent. I, I totally That's agree. That's a good answer. <laughs> you know, everyone runs around saying, you know, everything's energy, everything's energy. And then they say, but you've got to eat this, but you've yeah, got to, well, but but if it's just energy, then I can transmute it into whatever I want. Yeah, you either believe you create your reality completely mm. or you don't. There's no there's no middle, you know. So and I mean I, I walk around saying, look, I'm always right. And basically <laughs> I'm usually uh, no, there's no you as well, hey. I'm, I'm always <laughs> right about things. And it may take people five, ten years to figure it out, but then they'll come back and they'll go. You were right. You were right. <laughs> You're always right, Tracy. <laughs> but, you know, is that a self-fulfilling prophecy? You know, well, exactly. I mean, <laughs> because it's but, amazing. Self-fulfilling prophecies are an amazing thing. Use them. Use them. You know. Uh, like, yeah. You I mean, I, I I call myself a fucking truth. I am all about truth seeking, and like I always uncover the truth. Yeah. Like it is matter of fact for my life. I will uncover the truth. It's just who I am and what I do. So I always think I'm right as well. I, think <laughs> I always think I'm We're right, right. <laughs> but I always think I'm only right to the level of understanding that I've uncovered. So yeah. I know how much more. I know yeah. what I don't know. I so, know I know nothing. Yeah, you know? yeah. 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 But, but the one thing I do know, I'm right about. Yeah. <laughs> It's absolutely true. So <laughs> here we are. We're in this like fantastic, like insanely creative and um, chaotic and complex moment in the human journey here on planet Earth. Like really no different from a chapter in your book. Hello. We're no. really no different from a chapter. I, look, in your- Masters of Reality, I've had people writing to me going, oh, my God, you you predicted everything in that. You even got the year right. Like 2020 is a chapter in Masters of Reality. And it was just like, wow, it's not like I didn't warn you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we've, we're going, we're heading to, into, we're into November now. That's been a very strongly prophesized month in this unfolding. Like we're looking at, you know, potentially getting some like normality. World, mm, so any thoughts you want to share with the audience about November or um, going into 2022 this year, Trace? No fear. Two no words. Fears. No fear. It's a mantra in all of my books. It's like, you know, what you resist persists, okay? Give evil nothing to oppose and it will disappear all by itself, you know? Don't fear it. Stop panicking nobody else is going to give you this damn virus you're going to give you this damn virus if you fear it you know and 
seriously, if it's meant to happen, it will happen. You know, maybe it's part of your karmic journey or something. Who can say? But what's the point of fearing it and bringing it on, mm. you know? Mm. What is the point of what good is it doing anybody, mm-hmm. you know, to, mm-hmm. to fear this stuff? And, and sending other people who maybe are not as advanced as you into some sort of, you know, cascading spiral of fear you know and because that's what they're trying to do like that's what the mainstream media are all about i am so pleased to sit there and watch a spiritual um transmission like this there's a lot of other great people out there doing it as well it is so comforting because you go oh my god I'm not the only, like, I thought I was starting to go insane. I thought it was just me. I was the only person out there that actually, no, actually the majority of people out there are are thinking just the way that you do. They can see it. You know, people say follow the science and yet they're looking to the television. It's like they're not (laughs) going out there and and listening to what the doctors that actually created the science are saying, Mm -hmm. you know. They're not looking outside this country to see how they're handling it in other parts of the world. And then they're telling us, oh, you got it off YouTube, you're not following the science. It's like, well, that's the only place where anybody's actually telling us what's going on. It should be follow the science fiction my yes. Friends. yes. Follow yes. the science fiction. Yes, there's. Ma- I have maps. <laughs> Tracy has maps. Everyone, she has maps. That's, it's a lot we, better than the government. Tracy, sure. we need a map. We need a map to the Crystal City here in Australia. Could you like? Yeah. I, I would absolutely guarantee it's somewhere. It's somewhere right around the middle. If uh, and I think actually, um, is it JCK? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can solve this to that one. Uh, like in one of her transmissions ages ago, I remember watching her and she was talking about oh. that place. But the goo was there as well. Yeah. So whether it's all over it and like it's sort of found it and go, oh, yum, I'm just going to hang all over this, mm-hmm. which is quite probable. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, getting it off might be a bit of a problem. <laughs> um, might want to talk to her about that. But I would I would guess that that that's where it's hanging out and I mean like um, very very strong indigenous indigenous spirit there as well I mean you're talking about what the belly button of the world I think they talk about it being like (laughs) one of the chakras or the heart like that but I was definitely uh, drawn to Uluru I felt I felt it was very very spiritual and very beautiful Mm. Um, but that was just in you know my psychic perception of it but then like hearing her talk about what's you know, some of the stuff that's been going on there. I just sort of go, oh, my God, mm. we've really got some work to do. But I would definitely yeah. be, um, I'd, I'd be looking around there, at Kings Canyon, again, not very far from um, Kings Canyon. Well, we when we first started looking at the centre, um, we just like, we overlaid a map of the mining in Australia and um, we noticed that there was a circle right in the middle where there was no mining. It was really weird. And then we overlapped the old inland sea and it just happened to be the inland sea where they weren't mining. And then we went right to the side of it and it was a little um, fucking town called Hearts Range. (laughs) And so we were like, holy shit, Hearts Range. And then we like tuned into that and all of these insane crystals coming out of Hearts Range, like things we've never seen before. Crystals I have never, that look like building blocks and they're so five dimensional it was amazing stuff mm-hmm. so no but king's canyon let's add things. that to the to the map trace we're building a map here yeah. <laughs> anything else you want to add into the mix because we're actually making this map up well i mean the the olgas are out there as well i can't remember what the indigenous name for them is but um i know they're know? out in the general <laughs> area my story didn't go there where but, did your um, story go uh well mainly it was when they were in the red center, it was it centered mainly around Kings Canyon. But Tori had to do some sort of spiritual trek. See, uh, you know, you're talking about books I wrote 20 years ago. Yeah, man, that's the best. That's <laughs> what I wrote. Now, my what was she doing out there? Things. But she found a place. It was a sacred wo- woman's place. Um, they used to go there to give birth and stuff. So I can't imagine that it would be um, a, a very evil place because they just wouldn't have gone there, uh, not for not for birthing children. This is Kings Canyon. Yeah, Kings Ooh, Canyon. Oh, look at that wall. And, and right. that it's like you go down into it and, yeah, it's like all bush and and I thought what a great place to put a base. You could hide a base down there. Yeah. yeah. Is there and water you, down there? I think there, there, there probably is at certain times of the year. 
might dry out at certain times. They had their own. They had their own water source. They had gone deeper. Yeah. We, hello. Look. Yeah. Look. There we go. We've got. Yep. Um, uh, oh, nice. There we go. So everything, everything with Tartaria, no mountains, remember. So this is we're either looking at um, the remains of a melted, destroyed civilization, or we're looking at giant trees cut down or rubble from mining. So actually, there was something there that they call like the oh, what was it? it that was looks like, like mining. The ancient, that, that the ancient city or something. Oh my god, the ancient oh, yeah, city. Okay. Come on. Yeah. There was, what I can't remember what it was called. I might have to get back to you on that one. You do there, have to get back to us on that one. There is a place down there that um, they called like the ancient city or the something like that. It was just, yeah, and I, I remember thinking, cool. oh, look at that. Um, so it, it was just like all these big blocks and um, and so it did look like a city, kind of. Maybe blocks. if it had been covered by a volcano or mud, maybe. That, that um, looks very similar to um, what we would find normally with the mining and then they dig in and then come up and make these like walls. But the colour is so much like the melted realms. Yeah. Look at that looks like mining. What do you think, Campbell? It does, yeah. Or it's been, it could also be, it, it could also be, because it was an inland sea, you see That's a lot of those like, kind of formations under the water as well where yeah. tectonic plates have parted and stuff like that. So let me so ancient. Oh, look at that. Wow. Oh, plateau. <laughs> yeah, plateau. So that that would sometimes be a giant tree that's been cut down. So let's, yeah, that looks look at that. Look at that. Straight across there. How flat that is. Wow. Yeah, that's so flat. That's that mm. would be part of that sea, I would think. Let's um, so you have you have some inclination that there was ancient um an ancient city there let's and let's... they found they found one of those great big giant skeletons out there somewhere as what? well what really uh, yeah. seriously All right. let's um let me let's do some quick googling here see what comes we up. know they found an ancient city uh sort of near Uluru. yeah like exactly so um i can't remember what it was called but then I know that they found one of those great big giant skeletons out there somewhere as well. They did. Wow. I remember seeing a photograph of it. I don't know how long it stayed up on the internet or if they're <laughs> yeah, like down yet. <laughs> yeah, let's so, build all right, that let's now. find it. Hey, um, giant skeleton. We just do these live skeleton to see what comes up <laughs> together with we. Whoa, what is all this? That looks like we've gone into some computer land. Kings Canyon. Australia. I don't know if it was Kings, but it was Red Sand. Oh, what was that up in the? What's I... this? Yep, unearthed in Australia. That could be it. Yep. Try that. Pretty big bar. Is that a spine? It was big. I oh, know from Huge. Adelaide. Like, I look at that. I mean, for fuck's sake, it's huge, right? Yep, it's huge. It's huge. And um, look, look, there's water. And it's not the first one they've found, not by a long shot. I mean, it, I think it might be the first one they've found here. But, you know, if your mud theory is right, God knows how deep you yeah. have to go to. What's underground, yeah. Like we've, so, we've literally found buildings that have got two stories underground with I doors know. and windows. Look, when you started that talk and you were talking about the streets going sideways, because my father was a builder. Okay, yeah. so I'm looking at that and going, okay, so they wanted to build on a mountain and so they've leveled off where the building is and that's just the way it was. But then when you started unearthing stuff and there's windows and doors down there and I'm going, <laughs> there's not an architect alive who would do that. Like, yeah, no. 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 <laughs> that blows that theory out the window. Oh, no, it's just like it's. So, you know, that's my practical because I'm I'm really, really, I have a practical mind. Like it, ha I, I, when I go into answering questions, I've got to be thoroughly convinced myself that it's it's plausible for mm. me to like incorporate it into the books or whatever. Like I have to understand it obviously to explain it to somebody else. Mm. And um, and again, like coming from a builder family, I was looking at that and originally thinking. <laughs> And That's then, the yeah, it's, I thought, it's but, up to like 20 feet at least that we know in some place. So, yeah, and, who knows what's under there? And the door, like, just so big. Like, <laughs> why were that? Like, you know, and, we were lucky if we could reach the doorknob. <laughs> yeah, there, there were bigger buildings, but they've, they've knocked them all over. 
Yeah, well, there I mean, ridiculously big buildings. What? How the hell? I mean, unless they were using sonic technology to move things around, which I think is absolutely a plausible thing as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, especially when you common. look at ORM, like this orbitally rearranged monatomic elements, which has come up in my books before as well, which is this stuff derived from gold that they could say put on um, an object, heat the object, and then the object would disappear. And then yeah. when it cooled, it would come back. So, but ah. that you could also get it to levitate, you know, if you got it to the right temperature. So you're thinking Egyptian sun, great big rock, oh, nice. bit of orm on top, and uh, we'll just float that over, yeah. you know. And that was going well. That makes that makes sense to me. Well, well it's like <laughs> Ed Lee Scallon and um, Coral Castle. You know, how did he do that? Yeah. that he's, yeah. um, he people <laughs> saw him and said that he pines. was. Yeah, those two little cones, the... like rocks. Yeah. Those rocks, that them. rocks. Um, I was what I was uh, listening to somebody talk about taking one of those hollow rocks over to um, Nassim Haramin because they were going to investigate it, and um, plane, it, yeah. it, it was going through the airport and it set off something because they. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think that was Michael Tellinger. Yeah, and going um, who, who belongs to this? <laughs> yeah, there was. There, there was there another was an story with, there going. Oh yeah, I've seen one of those. I know what that is. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's the same story, but. One of them, someone actually got on a plane and they were just sitting there. They just had this rock and suddenly they were over the loudspeakers, they grounded the plane and all these police came out and pulled yeah. him off the plane. And he's like, it's just a rock. Yeah. So <laughs> it must have been like screwing up their equipment. Like, yeah, uh, equipment. exactly. Interfering with all their, yeah. Av- so again, navigation. resonant frequency. Frequency. You know, uh, was it Einstein that said everything, Scott's, you know, it's, it's all, all frequency. Yeah. It's all to do with frequency. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's what we're looking at with star forts, with cathedrals that have organs. Well, they used to have bells, um, big domes and spires on them, you know, all this stuff. They're called, you know, cathedrals. It's like a cathode. And um, they've got the big cymatic windows on them, you know, those rose windows that they tell us are rose windows. So there's all these, you know, the old system was all frequency-based. Like, um we i knew some people here that were trying to get um like free energy off the the ground and um they originally came across the idea when they were i think they're in indonesia or somewhere and they saw one of those labyrinths on the ground and the, the scientists among them sort of looked at it and went that's not a that's not a labyrinth that's a coil and um sure yeah. enough uh, you know Tesla's Peyton and um, they went and had a look at it and everybody's going no we can't get it working we haven't been able to get it working he's going flip it he was left-handed <laughs> and it was like no that's not right and it's like has anybody tried that <laughs> it was like no it's like well you know and I think they did and they got it working but yeah. again a, a repressed like all the it was it was a project yeah thing. yeah well we look at like you know in in the great inventors, they all they really had was access to an inventory. Yeah, right. They were just yeah. bringing out the old oh, stuff yeah. and repurposing it. <laughs> exactly, like nothing on nothing on earth is new. We just rediscover stuff. Yeah. Well, except yeah. us, we're new. Yeah. That's, that's, we're I, don't know. I think we might have been here before. I mean, we're old but new. We we're all because fuck time. We're old yeah. and new. So, hey, um, I just want because I've got to get off this screen share. I've just taken it off. But this said, exploring the Garden of Eden in Kings Canyon. Yes. Did you guys read this headline? Like, that's uh, interesting. Hang that's on. I'm going to have interesting. Yeah. So, like, basically it says um, where there was um, an ancient Kings Canyon um, Garden of Eden prominent Garden of Eden, um, 20,000 years, whatever, if it doesn't times irrelevant, but there's all these species and caves and rock formations and the lost city. It's the lost, lost city. city. Yeah, lost city. Gotcha. It says, while in the Garden of Eden, you can discover an incredible selection of plant life and unusual rock formations. The lost city rock formations are easily identifiable. From the canyon's base, you can begin the King's Creek walk past all these ancient plants and scenery and then it goes on just talk about things but how's that wow we should maybe check out if you can camp there that could be a good place to have as a i think so i think we might land there's actually a thing called king's creek station which um 
We yeah, can... I think we visited that in the story at some stage. <laughs> All right. So that's just a camping facility. So we might have our first actual location point to meet everyone. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like a great place. You should and come, just, Trace. It's going to be wild. stunning. Yeah. It's really beautiful. It's almost here. Because that's the thing about my books too is that I don't like like all these post-apocalyptic you know, dystopian ugly places. I like to go really beautiful places. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's where we're all going, right? But it's like, yeah. So all my books go to these really amazing places because I'm, I'm just going. Like, once we get this on film, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> nice. Nobody's ever going to want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in summary, here we probably have to wrap this amazing dialogue up. It's been oh my gosh, fucking. Yeah. Awesome yeah, it's been talking like two to you. hours. Like, I know, like, this is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and we always congratulate everyone who stayed with us this long. Oh my God. Yeah. It's really important uh, um, um, that our ability to not like get just, you know, to actually be able to hold a two and two and a half hour conversation and stay focused on it is really important because, you know, we're losing those faculties. We're really turning into this fast food neuro pathway culture not us of course we are going back to antiquity we're yeah. going back <laughs> like i you know when i think about myself and what i know about myself like fucking i have held my um my domain and kingdom for a very friggin long time i've stood around stone tablets and tables and smoked pipes and spoken to you guys endlessly endlessly before now like oh my god so <laughs> when i met soul family i know like we have we've at talked. the party i'm going to <laughs> yeah yeah we're all gone <laughs> so we've got we okay you've given us a really interesting like starting point there with king's canyon thank mm. you that's a piece You're of welcome. the puzzle thank you. um we've had a fantastic conversation about oh, i mean you know just like jc it was just like whew, in all directions um anything i love her by the way if she's watching well she's got some great stuff oh absolutely anything that you um would like to leave with our audience now trace our audience is so unique a they have program busted their way out of this whole thing like tataria just busts it all out they're so smart. They've managed to get to this moment in consciousness. They've let all the programming go. They all of the stuff, um, like all of the first layer stuff, is well past their minds. They're, their imaginations are tuned in and switched on and turned on. Their intellect is wiring and firing. Their programs have been busted. Our audience is the fucking smartest in the world, Trace. And they are ready to fucking like take all of this information all of this synchronicity, all of this um, gnosis that they've gathered and wired a fire in like one, like. It's bizarre because my my readers, that's exactly what they're, because there's only a certain kind of people really that can t that can get into my books and just yeah. really hold, hold it, you know, yeah. and, and get it. And um, I will mention, okay, these books that are up here, yep. that is, that's the first trilogy of mine. Now, it's currently between publishers, okay? So it's just gone from HarperCollins and it's about to be released and nobody knows this. So this is this is uh, here for you guys. <laughs> um, it is about to be released as a 25th anniversary edition by Booktopia. If you go to Booktopia's site, they're already up. You can pre-order them. Great. And next year, and this is the big scoop, we're going to have a collector's edition in hardcover because awesome. my readers read these books so often that they are falling apart <laughs> and they're screaming for hardcovers for years and years. Wow. And so we're finally going to get them, which is really, really exciting news. And I haven't told anyone. I've been saving it for this interview. And we've saved it right to the end. So yeah, right to the end. Yeah, well done. <laughs> to make it to the end, are actually going to know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds um, like... I will tell them eventually. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so if you really want to get onto this series, I mean, I have a store to allthingstracy.com and I'll be selling autograph copies through there. But... Like I said, they're up for pre-order on Booktopia or if you want to go and check out what the new covers look like, they're all up there. So, yeah. awesome. and I mean, really, 
if you take this journey, every book will just take you one layer deeper, one layer deeper, one layer deeper, one layer deeper, because I promise myself, I would never write a sequel just for the hell of it. It had to take you further. It had to take you deeper than the last one. And that's what I've done with every single one of these books. And I mean, I've had people come to me and go, oh, I started at Cosmic Logos, which is like book number six. Okay, there's 13 in this series mm -hmm. alone. I have others, but in this series. And that's like really, really quite getting quite heavy esoteric. I was going, wow, that's really jumping in the deep end. But the, the trilogies after that, you're in another universe. So it's going very quantum after that into quantum theory and stuff. So it's kind of like you covered the whole gamut because I think this first six books were all very um, esoteric based and that's not a cult. Okay. Anybody who doesn't know the difference <laughs> esoteric means anything undiscovered. Okay. So all those things that become science eventually because we figure it out, that's esoteric. And then you go into uh, like all the quantum theory, which connects so beautifully. If you've studied metaphysics, when you go into quantum physics, it's kind of a very easy step to go with the quantum theory. Like I don't do all the math. Okay. I don't get the math. But, um, <laughs> as far as all the theory goes, it just makes absolutely perfect sense to me because I've studied uh, metaphysics and I make everything so much fun <laughs> the characters are so much fun they're so great to hang out with so so Trace would oh, you sorry. recommend um so I'm going to say to our audience that this uh, consider this to be like a GPS system series books like it's a GPS yeah. for your coordinates yeah. yeah through this time so would you recommend um our audience start from the beginning or do you recommend them jump in at a certain because book they jump all over time and space it doesn't actually matter. Um, you can't, because then you're just going back into the history. Like if you're over here and you go, oh, wow, that was great. I'll go back into the history. But um, Ancient Future is where I would start because there is a prequel to the Ancient Future. But seriously, there's kind of spoilers in there. Not that you remember them by the time you get through all 12 books <laughs> and you'll still get back there and go, oh, my God, epiphany, you know. <laughs> So, and they're just, it's been designed that way to kind of just slowly ease you into those kind of epiphanies that change your life, that make you walk out of the job, that make you follow your passion, that make you, you know, reassess the way you look at life, I think. And I think like the yeah. word, I mean, we are, we are the ancient future. Like that, I, this is you Tartarian hunters. You are literally the ancient future <laughs> in, in um, embodiment here in yep. manifestation. So I love that title. That title is just the, the best, best, best. I don't think you could write a better title than the ancient future. And um, I think as far as Tartaria goes and the <laughs> consciousness that is wrapped around this whole unfolding, yes. it's a perfect place to start. I myself will be reading this trilogy and I think I will um, carve out the time when we're on our way to the desert. I think I'm going to lead the expedition from my side of Australia into the <laughs> desert with your three books, Trace. I, I just have decided that live on the spot. Well, and Masters of Reality goes to Wadaraka. Like they spend a lot of time in Wadaraka by the time you get to the third book. So, you know, they have a few revelations there as well. Yeah. And look, I really, I feel like, I don't know what series you're going to um, travel with, Campbell, because Campbell and I are coming from different sides of the country to meet in the middle of Australia. And <laughs> we're going to be yeah. live with a, a 10,000 strong audience following us through this journey. Um, so <laughs> it's so cool, right? So, and like everyone's really convinced we're going to find this thing and whatever happens, you know, we're expecting magic, 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 magic all the way. It will be magic out there. So yeah, I'm in lights and all sorts of things out there. Well, I'm publicly declaring that your three books are going to be um, my GPS through this period. So, and with with that GPS through my my brain connecting to the direction I'm heading in from, it's going to filter in in this like beautifully nonsensical, imaginative way that is going to be so synchronized and so flowy. So. Tracy, it has been an absolute honor. And I can tell you, this isn't, this isn't just three strangers meeting today. I know who you are. And I know who you are. And Campbell and I have um, much honor and reverence for who you are throughout all time. And it is a privilege and an honor, our friend, to have this conversation with you, master historian of all time. 
Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, guys. And thank you for creating this beautiful space for people to visit and be inspired. It's wonderful. I'm going to send all my readers here. <laughs> Yay, thank you. I'm going to go check this out. <laughs> Campbell, awesome. anything you want to say to wrap uh, it up? No, that was great. We'll obviously leave links below so you can find Tracy's work, her website and books and everything. Uh, and, yeah, guys, that's that's it, right? It's, we've just got to make our own decisions. Whatever we focus on, we create. So yeah. choose wisely and let's go yes, find Crystal exactly. Cities. Be aware of what you're thinking. It's so important. And be in gratitude always because it's it's yeah. not all doom and gloom. It's really this is an amazing place. This is an amazing opportunity. We get to go co-create with the universe. I mean, how good is that? Jesus. Just get better than that. Jesus. So, like, what a great word to Jesus. end on. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. <Okay>. Jesus. <laughs> All right, Tartarian Hunters, right. another fantastic episode. Thank you for watching and following us this far. Big love to everyone and have a great week and we'll see you next week on Tartaria Australia. Thank <laughs> you.